It's no big secret that if we want to hook readers from the first chapter, we actually have to write a first chapter that hooks readers. With TBR stacks getting taller and taller and Netflix releasing a new bingeable show every 20 minutes, gone are the days when readers will graciously give new books 50, 25, or even 10 pages to get good. The first chapter, or even the first few pages, are sometimes all we get. So, is your novel's first chapter hooking readers or turning them away? Coming up, my top five mistakes writers make at the start of a novel and how to fix them. Hello friends, I'm Jessica Brody, author of Save the Cat Writes a Novel, as well as more than 20 novels and the founder of the Writing Mastery Academy, where you can get unlimited access to all of my online writing courses, live webinars, the Writing Mastery community, and more. Okay, so let's talk about that first chapter of your novel and make sure it's doing what it needs to do to ensure your reader doesn't put your story aside in favor of the next book in their stack. In this video, I've compiled a list of the top five mistakes I see writers make at the start of their novels. One of these things can mean the difference between a reader voraciously turning to chapter two or stamping your book with that dreaded DNF label. So let's break them down. Number one, starting your novel in the wrong place. Where does your story actually start? Surprisingly, it might not be what's written on page one. In first drafts, it's common for books to start in the wrong place because we're still fiddling around with the details and discovering things about the plot and the characters and the world. And often we plop our characters down in the middle of a kind of humdrum day when nothing really happens. Not exactly riveting stuff. When choosing the right place to start your story, ask yourself, why is this day important to the character? Maybe it's the day of a big event, a big test, a big game, a big promotion. Maybe something is starting today, or ending today, or changing today. Maybe it's the day of the reaping. Okay, don't use that, I'm pretty sure it's already been done. By starting on an important day in the character's life, you automatically show the reader what's important to your character, which is a fabulous way to create instant intrigue about that character. Number two, too much focus on voice and not enough on plot. Don't get me wrong, we all love a unique literary voice that sucks us in from the get-go and makes us scream, yes, now this is an interesting character, oftentimes aloud in public. But there's a curse that comes with being a writer with a strong voice. We tend to rely too heavily on it from the start and forget that there's also supposed to be a plot going on. So even if you start your novel with a pitch perfect voice solo, what I like to call those long paragraphs or pages of text that highlight a character's voice, but don't necessarily move the plot forward. Make sure you don't neglect the other instruments in your storytelling symphony, like action and dialogue, also known as the stuff that does move the plot forward. Readers will only indulge our voice solos for so long before they start itching for something to happen. Number three, too much info dumping. It's easy for us writers to want to give our readers a whole slew of information right from the start particularly if we're writing a story with a lot of world building or complex character backstories. After all, we spent a long time brainstorming all of that information. We want to show it off. Not to mention, it's kind of important to the plot. While that may be true, too much info dumping in the first chapter is a surefire way to turn off the reader. Readers need to be invested in the story and the characters before they're willing and excited to learn all there is to know about them, which is why I like to do what I call info sprinkling. This is when you sprinkle in just enough information to be useful, and better yet, mysterious, but not enough to bore the reader or weigh down the opening pages. Make them want to read more. Make them earn that information instead of giving it to them for free. Some of the best use of info sprinkling that I've read recently is in Six of Crows by Lee Bardugo. All of the POV characters are carrying around some serious baggage from their past, and we get just the slightest hints of it in the opening pages of each of their chapters, just enough to intrigue us and make us want to keep reading to find out more. Number four, not enough unknowns. In the same vein as sprinkling in information, withholding information is also a great writerly trick to lure readers past the first chapter. 
Unfortunately, too many writers are afraid to withhold information. They're afraid that if they don't give the reader everything they need to know right off the bat, the reader won't be able to follow the story. Here's the thing. Readers want to know stuff. And when we simply tell them what they want to know, we take away the fun of reading. Imagine if you're on a treasure hunt, but instead of a cool map with cryptic clues and faded text, someone simply told you where the treasure was. You can't even call that a treasure hunt. It's just a treasure go-to. If we start treating elements of our story like a treasure hunt, creating unknowns for the reader to hunt down through the pages of the novel, we're sure to keep them reading. There are lots of options for what you can withhold from your reader in the very first chapter to keep them reading. Like, what happened to this character to make them so terrified of escalators? What's the identity of the person leaving secret notes in this character's locker? Why has this character's best friend stopped speaking to them? What is this character keeping in the locked box in their nightstand? Why does this character want to avenge their father's death so badly? And don't forget those unknowns can be unknown to the character as well. You can withhold information from your reader and your narrator at the same time, creating two treasure hunts in one. And finally, the fifth mistake I see writers make at the start of a novel is not enough stakes. Regardless of where the story starts, regardless of how much voice we use or don't use, or how much we withhold or info dump onto the page, none of that will matter if your story doesn't matter. Meaning it'll all be for nothing if you don't build in stakes from the start. Stakes are essentially what the hero has to win or lose from whatever is happening at that moment in the story. Which means stakes can change depending on what moment of the story we're in. And I'm not just talking about the kind of physical stakes you read about in thrillers, although those work too. I'm talking about any type of stakes, internal or external, physical or emotional. Even the best character-driven contemporary stories start out with some type of stakes. Take The Sun is Also a Star by Nicola Yoon, for example. The stakes for Natasha are clear from the start. Unless she can stop her family's deportation, life as she knows it will be over or take The Goldfinch by Donna Tartt. The story opens up in a hotel room in Amsterdam after the narrator has done something so bad it's splashed all over the front of the Dutch newspapers, making him terrified to even leave his room. What did he do? Well, we won't know for a while. There's some stakes and information withholding in one. But far too many novels start without any stakes, which makes it really hard for the reader to care about what happens next. And when a reader doesn't care about what happens next, they're not very likely to want to read about it. So take a look at the first chapter of your novel or your current work in progress and ask yourself if it suffers from any of these very common ailments. If it does, perhaps that's something to add to your revision plan for the next draft. Speaking of revision plans, if you're looking for help building a solid one that ensures you're passing all the checkpoints of a successful next draft, be sure to check out my complete novel revision course, which comes with comprehensive revision checklists, strategies for self-diagnosing and revising common problem areas in your manuscript, and revision demos, where I walk you through a revision of one of my own novels from the structural edit to the scene edit all the way to the line edit. The complete novel revision course is available to stream now in the Writing Mastery Academy. Links to that, plus my free revision kickstart guide, can be found in the description below. If you liked this video, please let me know by hitting that thumbs up and subscribe button. Until next time, happy writing everyone!